Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tree Talk Chat. Uh, today we're at episode number 38 um, and earlier this week on Monday we had a conversation with Phil from Canada. Uh, you know, great conversations about all kinds of things, you know, we're, he's doing there in, in uh, Ontario. So um, that is live on Instagram right now uh, and it will be going up on the other platforms over the weekend. So. Uh, uh, in the store here, you know, we had some nice people from Petzl in here uh, yesterday. They're building a corner here, you know, totally branded Petzl corner with all the shelves and stuff, so we can show the uh, the Petzl portfolio a little bit better. Um, also, some more stuff from Notch will be going up on the uh, homepage. We got a big delivery from the U.S. Uh, earlier this week, so uh, some more interesting products from them. Um, Today we're going back down under uh, for our second Australian guest, so we will be speaking to Samantha, um, also known as the Splice Witch. So um, Samantha is one of the best splices around and it will be very interesting to hear her uh, uh, tell a bore, uh, about her craft, especially from, uh, from an Australian splicer. So if you have um, any questions uh, during this uh, conversation, uh, Please uh, put them below in the uh, the chat field, and we will uh, try to answer them as we go along or at the end. So, we'll see if we have Samantha on here. Um, Not yet. She might be waiting in the lobby. So let's see. Yeah, our our cameraman here is um, trying to uh, contact her to see if there's any issues with uh, connections or whatever. So we'll see there if she's uh, coming on board soon. Yeah, one second. One second. She said she's fantastic with tech. Oh, she's very good with tech. <laughs> well, she's she's a good spicer, so you can't you can't be good at all things. Definitely not the greatest. Uh, there she is. Good evening. Good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's a bit of a, a warm day in Australia, which is kind of like saying the sky is blue, but yeah, I'm pretty good uh, yourself. How hot is this? Um, I think it was supposed to be in the 30s today, but I think it only really got up to the, the high 20s. Okay, nice. Nice. So, um, what you been up to? Um, mainly just gear maintenance today, washing ropes and whatnot, and decided to make a, um, a foot loop for no reason in particular. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, so tell us, how did you, uh, you know, end up in this industry? You know, what did you do before? So beforehand, um, I worked in a call center for about two and a half years, getting yelled at people. Um, so decided to do basically the same thing in trees. Um, I, um, I just came across a random video of people climbing and, um, I thought that looks awesome. Is this like just an extreme sport or something? Then I looked into it and, um, found that people get paid to do this. So I thought, well, that looks you know, exciting, um, yeah. and interesting. So I'm going to go do that. That's cool. So how long how long have you been doing that now? Uh, three years. Three years. Yeah, it's okay. relatively new. And and that was uh, then uh, kind of a, a segue into how to uh, you know learn how to splice, right? Yeah, or yeah, what, my what boss. Start? So I, I essentially started splicing because I um I didn't really want to pay for it, and I thought if I could learn how to do it myself, you know, I could make a lot of custom equipment for myself and whatnot, and it um, kind of just turned into a bit of a passion project. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, have, have you uh, done uh, any splicing courses, or are you self-taught? So, um, primarily self-taught. My boss originally taught me um, some basic principles and taught me how to do a 16-strand splice, just the yeah. traditional 16-strand splice. And from there, um, it was mostly practice, research, and um, uh, speaking with other splices and um, you know, a, a little bit of collaboration and whatnot. But primarily, it's all been self-taught. I um, I did purchase Nick Array's videos off uh, Tree Stuff when I first started. Okay. And 
that was very helpful. So, so uh, do you have? Are, are you? I suppose you're certified now with uh, you know different uh, you know rope manufacturers, right? So um, there has been expressions of interest from a number of them to go through certification, um, but a lot of them are tied to a retailer. So um, to actually get any form of certification from certain retailers, you must be splicing their cordage for a retailer of their products. Um, and that's not something that every splicer can really do unless you're importing and selling um, that stock yourself. So um, the main company I splice for being Arbormaster, they're primarily dealing with um, Teffelberger cordage. Um, and there is, I'm on a list to go through the program. However, uh, COVID has slowed down a lot of a lot of that um, process. Yeah, but you know, are are you? Um, <clears throat> is there any demand for certification on the splices in Australia? Uh, there is no certification for splicing in Australia. Okay. Uh, we borrow from um, a lot of European standards. Yeah. Um, so. Unfortunately, it's it is somewhat unregulated within Australia. Okay, because uh, I I know how it works because you know I we own the certification for uh, the the drain line initially to to uh, you know start with we're going to do tachyon in a while so uh, we own the certification and then you know supplies are connected to us and we uh, do it uh, you know CE and E in the group. But I, I thought you uh, you were kind of adhering to the ANSI standard uh, that, like they had in, have in the U.S., right? No. Um, there is uh, one Australian standard, but it more pertains to uh, height access. Um, okay. Again, CE, a CE standard isn't necessarily a, a, a thing in Australia. Um, it's used more commonly as, as a reference guide. Uh, okay, okay. So, so how much how much time do you spend on, on splicing versus you know with the other things you do? So I'm a full time climber. I work five days a week, um, seven till three. Um, obviously, sometimes overtime and whatnot. Um, but realistically, I I don't do a great deal of orders, um, mainly because shipping outside of Australia is incredibly expensive, um, yeah. and. Yeah, very, very expensive, often more than the, the price of the actual splicing. Um, so I'm primarily doing rather small things, um, sometimes a week with a single order, sometimes less. Um, and sometimes, like recently, I've had nine orders all at once. Um, so it's fairly sporadic. Um, okay. And I do find a lot of my splicing is um, some, somewhat for myself as well, um, as a and full-time climber. Yeah. So uh, cool, cool. Um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about your your awesome logo and uh, you know your your business name. How how did that come about? So a while back, I was fiddle fighting around with um, some eight mil B line, which is a, um, a Vectran core, which calls for a class one splice um, you know, locking Brummels, and I wanted to have both eyes covered. Now, doing a, a locking Brummel. Um, with a covered eye has been a thing for a while, but doing it with both eyes on the end of um, an eye to eye um, is a bit of a pain in the backside. Um, and one method is to um, rebraid the core completely um, to create the second locking Brummel. Um, and I think it was just a random thought. Um, I posted a picture of the process and um, said the, the supply switch is working on something. Um, right. And that, that phrase kind of stuck with me and I liked it. So um, I decided to get on my computer and I still had a, an old drawing tablet from when I was um, studying engineering and um, drew up the logo. Right. Cool. So uh, um, uh, <clears throat> is there, you know, um, a lot of people here uh, you know, are interested in, in learning the splice. Um, you know, there, there are different programs and, you know, uh, so is, is there any tips for people uh, that are looking to learn how to splice from, from your perspective? Um, the biggest thing for me is practice. Um, work on many different types of rope. Um, I've spent more on uh, random scraps of rope from my local arb stores, you know, 
offcut bin and I care to think about splicing, practicing technique and then cutting it open and having a look at the uh, construction and, that I've achieved and seeing points um, where I want to make improvements and gaining a real understanding of the dynamics of the construction that you're making. Um, so I would say practice as much as possible. Um, right. Don't start splicing and expect that you're going to make something uh, worth climbing off of immediately. Um, buy some buy some off-cut rope and just start practicing and um, understand that it does take a fair bit of time to become confident in it. Okay. So uh, uh, is, is there is there any videos on YouTube or anything that you have, uh, you know, participated in or maybe you can hint on? Um, nothing that I've personally participated in. Um, I have floated the idea around of doing um, some, I guess, more professional videos than just the, the tips and tricks videos that I've posted before. Um, Nick, as I said, Nick Array's videos on tree stuffs where I first started out. Um, and his work was very, very helpful um, when I was in, I guess, that uh, initial learning stage. Um, but I do find that a, a lot of um, advanced splices are a little secretive of the techniques that they've developed over time. You know, you've put a lot of time and effort um, and research into your work and um, it can be a little... Uh, some people can be quite hesitant of just giving giving that away, but I, I do want to do, um, I guess, some more professionally um, produced videos on splicing in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, I can I can see that because there, you know we're we're also selling some some bits and tapes and scissors and, and stuff for splicing, and uh, I can see that you know uh, you know demand is increasing. Uh, you know, which tells me that people are getting more and more interested in doing that. But here, uh, I suppose it's more of a more of a problem for for people to do spices they can climb on since we, uh, you know, have regulations and, you know, to adhere to different standards. But, you know, for, for rigging equipment or loops or, you know, woofies or swings or, you know, on, on double braid or, you know, a hollow braid, you know, that, that's another story, I guess. So, so um, um, which are the ropes that are the most difficult to spice? Um, probably Scandia from Yale. Um, it took me about... 20 minutes to half an hour to get the core out of that and it usually just takes a few seconds on like a standard double braid um, and about 15 minutes into that I sat down and thought I'm not enjoying this in the slightest and I usually enjoy splicing. Um, that was a horrific, um, horrific rope to splice. Um, there are a few that I just flat out reject doing. Um, Used CE Cougar is a horrible rope to splice. Um, so most of the time I'll reject um, a request to re-splice um, used CE Cougar. Uh, and and uh, on the flip side, which is the easiest one to splice? Um, some Yale ropes. Um, Arrowfrog is Yale Arrowfrog is one that I definitely recommend for people starting out. It's um, very very easy to splice. Um, non CE Cougar, which is also called um, all poly Cougar, which the core and the jacket are both polyester. Um, that's wonderful to splice. I do a fair amount of that through Album Master, and um, I, I could quite happily do that all day. Yeah. So mostly, mostly Yale ropes, right? Um, a lot of the Yale ropes are fairly easy to splice. Some do present a little bit more of a challenge, like um, uh, uh, blue tongue. Yeah, Yale yeah, blue tongue is not the most pleasant thing to splice. It's a little mushy and it's a little um, difficult to do the final berry. It's also quite stretchy, so um, you put a fair amount of effort um, getting the berry. Um, yeah going on that compared to some others. Um, Prism has a fairly harsh jacket compared to some others. Um, it's a slight slight increase on the, the strand twist on Prism that gives it a bit harder of a feel. I can be a little bit harder on your hands. Uh, are, are you doing uh, any of the Teufelberger uh, ropes? Um, yeah, so at the moment, um, I'm not doing adrenaline for retail until 
I've gone through the certification through the retailer that I splice for, um, and currently Tachyon is being done through um, Tachyon and High V are both being done through the original instructions um, oh, okay. by New England. So, but you have sent in some some uh, samples that are you know being approved, or not for not for um, Tefl Burger at the moment. No, again, oh. I'm, I'm on the list of people they oh. want to get through for their retailers, but um, apparently oh. COVID's proving pretty oh. trying. Okay, so a uh, bit of bit of a process there. So, uh, tell us about your you know your your um, Quran ambassadorship. You know, how how did that come about? So um, I was initially contacted by Courant um, after having purchased a few of their products and uh, really liking them. Um, and they sent me some ropes um, to, to splice up and try out. And I really did enjoy um, climbing on a few of them. Um, and then in talks with um, a few people from Courant and having already um, made a bit of a friendship with some other people uh, on the ambassador team, I was asked if I'd like to be the Australian ambassador for Quran, um, to which I said yes, and um, I've really been enjoying using a lot of their products, and um, a lot of the social aspect of speaking with the, a lot of the people from Quran and the other ambassadors, um, pretty happy with um, the group of people that you know, I, I get to associate with there. Yeah, nice. So uh, are, are you splicing any of the Quran uh, ropes? Um, it's struggling to, to get into Australia at the moment. Um, we've recently gotten a, an Australian retailer, ALS Trade, in Queensland. Okay. Um, however, shipping times are being delayed due to COVID again, and um, there's obviously some logistics uh, stuff that I'm not particularly privy to. But um, you, do, you are seeing more and more current cordage come in from... Um, Overseas from places like Honey Brothers. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we're we're um, we're waiting for some some sample ropes as well because we're looking to be uh, you know approved on the front uh, ropes as well. So um, uh, I'm in talk with uh, the guy who's in charge of that in, in France. So uh, we're waiting for for that to uh, uh, come up here any day now, so we can uh, you know have them spliced and send in samples for approval. So that would be interesting. You know, predominantly it's going to be the Aurora and Samora, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, nice. Um, uh, so how long have you been been an ambassador for Grant then? Um, it's been less than a year now. Um, I can't remember exactly when it's happened. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's been under a year. It's been, uh, I'd say, maybe five months from memory, but that could be wildly off. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, but, you know, how, how's the representation from, from Quran? Is it predominantly through a retailer in Australia, or do they have, uh, you know, a Quran uh, person on the ground, or? No, it's, again, the the, um, the presence in Australia is pretty sparse. Um, being a, a large island um, nation with a relatively low population to, to land mass density, it's it is um, a bit difficult to to spread out throughout the country, um, mm. so I, I guess um, I might be one of the the main current uh, influences within the country. Uh, nice, nice. So, uh, <clears throat> do you find any problems to kind of you know balance your your work and, and splicing, or you know, uh, we talked a little bit about that, but you know. Are you doing, uh, you know, do you have to, to um, sacrifice a lot of your spare time to do to, to splicing? Yeah, I pretty much have little to no spare time, but I've somewhat thrown myself into tree work in general and arboriculture in general. Um, so it's not necessarily something I lament a great deal. I, I enjoy every aspect of it. Um, but, I, yeah, I, I don't get a lot of free time at all. Uh, any free time that I get is usually spent splicing orders or going and climbing and practicing. So it's basically work and sleep, huh? Pretty much. And um, <laughs> it's about an hour and a half drive into work. And whenever I tell people, um, I guess from my local area where I live, 
Um, the initial uh, question is the same every time. Uh, you drive into Melbourne every single day, um, and yes, I do. So, yeah, um, even if I weren't splicing, I'd still have fairly limited free time. Um, and then the question following that up is always, when do you find time to sleep, um, which I don't have a good answer for. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the shipment cost and, and bringing stuff into Australia and, and you know, back to the U.S. or, or Europe. So uh, have you done any work for, you know, customers outside Australia? Yeah, yeah, there's been definitely a, a handful of um, things gone out to Europe and America and um, New Zealand and whatnot, but I could probably count them on one hand. Okay. The uh, shipping's pretty heinous. Okay. Okay. So, so tell us about you know the the uh, kind of you know the working conditions in Australia. You know, uh, uh, everybody knows you have one of the you know the the most dangerous, venomous, uh, you know, reptiles and insects in the world. So uh, how do you cope with that? I guess it's a different story when you grow up with it. But, you know, for, yeah. for the people up here, you know, it's uh, kind of scary. I mean, we, um, we have someone on our team who's, who's, who's leaving to, um, to move into an, an ecology um, uh, field. Uh, that's, his, that's where his main qualification is. But we call him uh, Nature Boy at work, and he's often the one that um, deals with uh, snakes or possums or anything else that we encounter. But um, managing trees in an urban environment, you don't see a massive amount of snakes. Um, they definitely are there, but um, snakes generally don't enjoy uh, being around people. We're loud and messy and horrible. So um, mostly you see a lot of spiders, a lot of possums, um, maybe some skinks, which are generally pretty harmless. Um, so it's not, not really the, um, the biggest hazard in industry. Um, yeah. The most you get is maybe mauled by a, a bush tower possum. That's about it. Yeah, but I, I, I suppose you need to go outside the city to, to find, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the fair amount of the, of the reptile. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you know, they, they don't, don't like being around people, so. But, you know, spiders, you know, can be quite dangerous as well. You know, I, I have a friend who lived in, in Melbourne, actually, for five years, and uh, he said, you know, there, there was spiders everywhere. Yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty much are spiders everywhere. Most of them are afraid of you and just want to try and uh, very clumsily get away from you if, uh, yeah. if you come too close to them. Um, very rarely do you find one that's aggressive. Um, most of the time they just want to run away as best as they can. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, you also have some some very interesting arb inspired tattoos. You know, uh, tell us a little bit about those ones and and uh, what made you choose to to put your profession on your body. So um, I come from a, a mechanical engineering background, so I've I've kind of got um, a very high amount of appreciation for um, good design and good execution of that design as well. Um, so some of the things that I particularly uh, appreciate um, are pieces of gear that have become somewhat ubiquitous within industry, um, some innovations like the rope wrench um, that really do stand out as being quite unique and groundbreaking for their time, right. even though now we have um, devices like the, the Rope Runner Pro and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think some of the the precursors to, to all the super fancy stuff that we have now um, are really, really amazing designs within themselves. Um, you know, I've obviously only been in industry for three years, so uh, me talking about this kind of stuff is um, not entirely accurate, but just speaking with other arborists um, who, you know, have been climbing long before something like the Hitch Climber came out, and when that did come out, how innovative and groundbreaking that invention uh, was. Um, so I can definitely appreciate a lot of these things from a mechanical uh, engineering point of view um, and decided to have them stabbed into my arm. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if you come from in that background, I, I suppose, you know, it's a good interest. But, you know, it, it's amazing to see, you know, I've been down to Wales, you know, at DMM to uh, 
to see the manufacturing process and it's it's quite amazing you know what the things they do down there yeah it's absolutely fabulous yeah and a lot of that um the manufacturing process and whatnot i find really really interesting and i get fairly into it as well yeah it's uh you know uh you know the workshop is is uh, maybe not the cleanest but you know it's it's uh you know the the stuff they put out from there it's uh just uh, awesome you know all all the uh you know when they're pressing the aluminum that comes in and you know big roll blocks and you know at the end of the day you know there's uh there's you know hitch climbers or impact blocks or carabiners you know it's, it's just amazing the things they do just the polishing process of the material it's done in a big container with little dots of you know sand tops that you know rotate and vibrate and you know it's just uh, it's crazy but uh, very cool I like manufacturing processes me as well so it's, it's uh, nice to see that so uh, are are you uh, thinking of any any uh, upcoming uh, you know arbor related tattoos? Um, I have bought uh, an original runner. Um, like the the original signature rope runner, and that should be coming hopefully Monday. So I want to get um, a fair few hours on that. I think the aesthetic um, of the original runner is really unique, and um, again, it's another one of those devices that have become somewhat ubiquitous, um, you know, have been fairly groundbreaking within themselves, and is so widespread throughout industry. I most likely have that on the bottom of my arm, but I think it'd be bit vain to do so without getting a fair few hours on one beforehand. Okay. Yeah, we're, you know, the, the Rope Runner Pro has been out for, what is it now, six months? You know, we're, we're still waiting for it to be approved here in Europe. So, um, you know, and that seems to take a long time. Yeah, so I mean, the, the... people are really eager to, to get their hands on it. But, you know, I, I know that some people have just bought it from the U.S. because, you know, they don't want to wait for you know, if you work for a bigger company, you know, you need to have approved equipment. So, uh, yeah, I suppose we need to wait for, for just a little longer before that comes. In yeah, and uh, yeah. this has been the same weight um, that you've unfortunately had to deal with with um, the Akimbo as well that recently got its C rating not too long ago. No, it was, uh, we got it, um, it was approved uh, uh, probably uh, May last year. So, uh, but you know, uh, that took uh, about a year for Rock Exotica to get it approved. Yeah. But uh, now it's approved, and uh, you know, um, it's out there. Um, I still have some some on the shelves, but I think you know people are waiting for the uh, the rope runner and the pro now to. Uh, so um, the sales have gone down on the on the uh, Kimba. Yeah, there's always a bit of hype when um, a new device comes out, and uh, yeah. Um, the, the Rope Runner has been, honestly, um, an absolutely fabulous uh, device so far. Um, I won't say it's uh, perfect in every aspect, um, but it definitely has been um, pretty much the go-to SRT device pretty much every day. Yeah. So that, what, that what, has been. Was, was the first Rope Runner designed by Kevin Bingham as well? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh... Okay. That was singing uh, for it. Is... And he made, you know, the upgrade to the Pro. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, yeah, we uh, recently got the uh, the Love 3 as well from Pass. Yeah. Have you seen that? I have. Um, I've got the uh, the original, not the original, but I have the, the, the Love 2. And uh, um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how much time on setup for Ascent events the uh, the Love 3 is going to gonna shave off there. Um, being able to keep, essentially keep it uh, attached um, onto your bridge and, you know, your tending device, whether that's a neck tether or a chest harness, and being able to simply chuck the rope in, swing the side cheek and have it immediately ready. So yeah. that'll, be, that'll be interesting. I think it will definitely dominate a lot of the ascent events. Yeah, because, you know, you can still have the carabiner attached to the device once you open it, then, you know, it has its midline attachable, you know, both versions. But, you know, this one this one can be, uh, you know, still attached when you uh, change this. So yeah. that's, uh, that's a cool device. I have one hanging on a rope here, uh, just uh, left to my right. So um, uh, tell us about your funniest job story. Pardon, sir? Can you tell us about your funniest job story? Something funny that ends up that you're. 
something funny or crazy? There are many, many stories. One that sticks out in recent memory, um, and I hope Tom's not going to watch this, but he probably will because it's about him. Um, so we uh, use 3M um, radio system on our helmets at work so everyone can speak to one another. Um, and I was leaving site with um, a co-worker to go to the next job site and start there while the cleanup was being finished at the, the recent um, job, which was a Chinese elm prune. And it was overhanging a neighbor's yard um, and then the neighbor had a dog. Um, Tom went into the neighbor's yard to continue cleaning up, picked up a rake and found that someone had put the rake down <laughs> in some relatively fresh uh, dog droppings. <laughs> and so I heard probably the most upset <laughs> Um, Tom, I've ever heard through the headset, which I still had on as I was walking to the truck, um, screaming in his poo on his rink, <laughs> uh, which he had all over his hands and then screamed, oh, it's going everywhere. Oh. So, um, I'll apologise to Tom for telling that story, but that definitely <laughs> is one of the most um, recent ones that sticks out in my mind. Well, yeah, that's pretty nasty. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, that probably have happened to um, a lot of us that, you know, you, uh, you're stepping into dog poo, right? Yeah, either stepping into dog poo, having your rope dragged through dog poo, or putting your oh. throat key down on drug, dog poo, and only realizing until you've got a shot and you go to fold it up and realize that exactly. you've put it Exactly, all over. That's pretty nasty. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, um, it, it's getting better now because a lot of people are, are picking up, you know, their, what their dog leads after them. So, uh, yeah, it hurts. like 10, 15 years ago, it was everywhere. I'm, I'm glad I got into the industry when I did then, when people became a bit more <laughs> conscious. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you sport on the pavements, you know, and on beaches. And yeah. Stuff. yeah, in general, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what is your what is your favorite piece of gear of all time? And uh, don't tell me it's twice <laughs> Um If I had to pick one that I'd say I if I if I didn't have any gear and I was starting from scratch and I wouldn't even think twice about buying one, it'd probably be um, a positioner. Um, I enjoy climbing on prussic cord from time to time and whatnot. I think it's great if you've got a good uh, hitch combination with your rope and you've got the, the length of your hitch cord dialed in, it can yeah. be great. But um, I don't think I'd ever go back to tending my, um, my lanyard with a hitch. This is a perfect little device in my eyes and um, I'd, I'd always recommend one. I think they're brilliant. And you have, the, you have the pink one as well, right? Yeah, so um, whenever uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month comes comes around and all the manufacturers starting re uh, to release pink gear, I always try and try and get I know, it, so. I, I, still, I still have a few of those in stock, to be honest. Hmm. I still have a few Perfect. pink ones left. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I also have about 400 meters of the adrenaline pink that came out in the October last year, so uh, yeah, yeah. Or, I, uh, uh, I think I ended up giving it away to a co-worker who needed a rope at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. so cool. So, um, um, do we have any uh, questions from from the audience, or you know, uh, see here, if, uh, somebody's asking some questions. Uh, how did you get into the spizing uh, wizard and the, the witch witch group? So um, my my efforts um, caught the eye of uh, a few, um, I guess, fairly advanced splicers, people who are, I guess, uh, leaders within the little world of splicing. And um, I was talking to Peter, who's um, one of the, the members of the, the little group we have going, and um, I think I asked him, is there room for a witch uh, in this? Because it was originally the Slicing Wizards. Um, and uh, 
he obviously had a, a talk with the others to see if they were happy to have me and everyone was and um I've done some collaboration work with them and I really enjoyed um being able to you know speak with some very competent advanced splices and learn off them and share some ideas and yeah it's been brilliant cool I see I think we have a few other here that uh see here uh what is the best trick to make splices look so good a lot of practice 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 really pay attention to detail yeah. um and really try and understand the um the dynamics of um what you're doing as well um how the assembly reacts to different things that you're doing and um yeah essentially just practice a lot yeah, I suppose, you know, you need to pay attention to the construction of the core as well, you know, because, you know yeah. when you milk it and stuff, you know, is get different results. Yeah. So uh, do you enjoy splicing the Quran ropes? Yeah, um, I've been working with um, the the group, you know, Splice Wizards and, and Witch on the, um, the Squire Splice, which has been brilliant, um, collaborating with them on putting that together and um, and whatnot. I really enjoy um, splicing the, the two 16 strand lines, the Kimura and the Canopa, um, just because the, the ropes themselves are so different from what, what I would consider like a traditional 16 strand, like um, Samson or um, Yale 16 strand lines. Yeah. They're far more supple. The core is um, quite different, being a, a braided uh, parallel strand core, um, but in a 16th strand construction um the splice itself is fairly unique um it's absolutely nothing like a traditional 16th strand um splice um and yeah you learn to appreciate really nice rope when you're yeah. having to, to work with um work with lots of different types nice nice so um i think we had one more uh, I, I can read that so i'll read it uh, with your engineering background, do you have something you'd like to design? Um, I have had thoughts um, about uh, getting into designing a device or um, something like that in in the future. Um, but again, the, the spare time factor is fairly low. So um, a lot of my ideas tend to be fleeting um, and then somewhat get forgotten and then possibly picked up at a later date and um yeah i've never really had a, a great amount of time to really dedicate um to, to an idea but um it would be nice to collaborate with um some manufacturers or other designers on um, either refining a design much like kevin has done with his rope runner um, yeah. or coming up with a new design cool so um, I'm not sure do we have any more questions. No, I think we answered them all. So um, thank you very much for you know being on this program. It was a pleasure to uh, you know talk to you and hear about you know your craft and what you're doing. Uh, it's always good to uh, you know talk to people around the world uh, to get a different perspective on, on uh, you know. But you know the arm industry uh, pretty much looks the same uh, regardless of where we are in the world. So. Um, a lot of nice people, a lot of interesting stories. So um, thank you very much. Have a very nice um, Saturday evening. And um, for all everybody else that was watching, thank you very much for, for being on. And um, we'll see you again. Uh, it's going to be Friday next week, I guess, um, since we have to juggle a little bit about, you know, the, the different time zones here. But um, Samantha, thank you very much. Have a very nice evening. You too. Thank you very much for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Was it. A pleasure. Take care. Thank you. You too.